It's Tuesday, and this is your Daily Detroit for July 14th, 2020. I'm Jer Stays. And I'm Sven Gustafsson. Big news today, as a big name in Detroit business, Maddie Maroon, the controversial billionaire owner of the Ambassador Bridge, has died. We'll discuss his life and complicated legacy. Plus, we've got the latest on coronavirus cases here in Michigan, an officer involved fatal shooting over the weekend in Detroit, protesters who shut down school buses in the city, and I interview Detroit City Council member Raquel Castaneda Lopez about a program to support undocumented people dealing with the impacts of coronavirus. That's all coming up right after this reminder to consider becoming a member on Patreon, just like our friend Lynn did. We work hard here at Daily Detroit each and every day to give you a concise and thoughtful rundown of the news you need to know around the Detroit region. We make it available to you for free on your podcaster of choice so you can listen to us whenever you want. But it's not free to make this your show, and that's where you can come in and help us. Go to patreon.com slash daily Detroit. Choose the level of support you're most comfortable with. In return, we'll say wonderful things about you on the show, and we'll even send you stickers and other swag. Help us push Detroit's conversation forward, and thank you. You know what nice thing I'll say about Lynn? She's a very fun person. The state of Michigan reported 384 new COVID-19 cases on Monday and seven additional deaths, putting our case total since the pandemic started at more than 69,700 and 6,075 fatalities. Cases per 100,000 people are slowly increasing in the Tri-County area, with Wayne leading the way. Outstate, cases in Kent County, so think Grand Rapids, Menominee, Crawford, and Oceana counties are rising rapidly. These numbers are driven in part by a house party in Washtenaw County. As of this recording, there are 43 new cases connected to the event in Saline, and possibly more may develop. The majority of these cases are in people 25 years or younger. There are nearly 70 close contact exposures related to the party, which could result in more cases at a variety of spots across the state. And I'm sharing this list to show just how many places that people who aren't being careful around COVID-19 are visiting. The Washtenaw County Health Department says that there are trace connections to retail stores, restaurants, businesses, canoe liveries, clubs, camps, athletic teams, and a retirement community. Health officials say that close contact exposure is when you've had face-to-face contact with someone who has COVID-19 for 15 minutes or more. Okay, as we mentioned, huge news in Detroit with the news that Maddie Maroon, the self-made Arab-American trucking magnet and billionaire, best known as the owner of the Ambassador Bridge, has died. He was 93 years old. Maroon leaves behind a complicated legacy in Detroit. He grew up on Detroit's east side where he helped run the family service station, and he returned to the city after graduating from the University of Notre Dame to help expand the family's trucking business. The Gross Point Shores resident took over sole ownership of the Ambassador Bridge in 1979 after buying out Warren Buffett's 25% share for 30 million bucks. The Ambassador Bridge is the only privately owned border crossing between the US and Canada, a factor that became a bigger issue after the attacks of September 11. Maroon was also the longtime owner of the derelict Michigan Central Station until he sold the long-abandoned train station to Ford Motor Company two years ago. He was CEO of holding company Centra, which controls the bridge and operates logistics and transportation businesses. Maroon ceded control of those companies to his only son, Matthew, several years ago. Forbes estimated Maroon's worth at $1.7 billion. In recent decades, Maroon was often at the center of controversies involving his properties. The state sued him over his refusal to build new modern entrance ramps to the bridge. He took land several times and condemned it for bridge projects he never received permission to build. And he vigorously opposed efforts to build a new publicly owned competing span connecting Detroit and Windsor. In 2012, he bankrolled a signature gathering drive that resulted in a statewide ballot proposal to require voter approval for any government-owned international bridge or tunnel in Michigan. It went down to a lopsided defeat, despite heavily outspending rival groups. 
Maroon also made lavish donations to lawmakers who refused to vote on whether to approve a new publicly financed border crossing. However, he was outfoxed by former Michigan Governor Rick Snyder, who went against his own party to make a deal with Canada to get what will be the Gordie Howe International Bridge funded. When I say work with Canada, the deal is Canada is footing almost all of the costs and getting paid back by tolls. Snyder had to do this as Maroon was an effective backroom dealer to block funding for a second publicly owned bridge that he feared would cost him business. Uh, so, Sven, uh, I think I I think we have some personal opinions around the news of the 93 year old Maroon's death. I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. I personally hope for the good of the community that we never let another billionaire have the kind of leeway that our politicians have given him. In my mind, Maroon was ruthlessly effective, and he worked the fact that, in my personal opinion, Michigan's legislature's motto should be two peninsulas where the campaign cash makes the rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, our legislature is so susceptible to campaign cash. It's insane. Both parties. And Maroon knew exactly how to exploit it, and he played it like a fiddle to his ends, and he was looking out for himself, and he was successful with it. And he, he knew how to do it, and to be honest, there are members of both parties that are, in my mind, mm -hmm. guilty to bending to his will as opposed to looking out for the community. Yeah, absolutely. I will start by saying something nice about Maroon, which is that he has a nice sort of rags to riches story, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, that sort of thing. You know, the son of Lebanese immigrants, which is great. You know, I mean, that's a nice story. I, I will say that. However, I think Maroon essentially became a postcard for the perils of private ownership of such a critical piece of international infrastructure. I mentioned like September 11th. I mean, you know, that there was always fear and there continues to be fear that terrorists could target the ambassador bridge and really bring the economies of two countries, you know, to its knees in so doing. You hear people talk about business people as good corporate citizens. I think Maroon was frankly not a good corporate citizen. He was the opposite of that. He cared first and foremost about Maddie Maroon and his companies and making money. He was I think arguably more hated in Windsor than he was in Detroit. Over on the other side of the river, you know, he bought up for years, he had been buying up properties surrounding the Ambassador Bridge. You know, he's always been trying to get a second span, you know, a twin span essentially built right next to the Ambassador Bridge. And he was buying up properties over there on the other side of the river and, you know, letting them sit abandoned and decaying for years. I mean, people were just furious with this. And the, the Canadian government, you know, has fought tooth and nail against letting him build a new bridge span there because uh, it makes no sense. It, it dumps truck traffic out into local streets, you know, that are far away from the freeways. That's part of the reason that they're building this new second government-owned span is because it's going to have much better linkage to the Canadian freeways and, and the U.S. freeways for that matter. He was also never able to buy off, you know, Canadian lawmakers in the same way he did U.S. and state lawmakers. You know, Matty Maroon just kind of did what he wanted to do. He ignored rules. I mean, I used to go running years ago back when I lived in Detroit in the neighborhood, you know, southwest Detroit down, including right near the foot of the bridge there. And I can remember uh, houses that one day that house was gone and the Maroons built the wall like separating their their truck plaza around the property that used to be there he never had permission to do that this is down in the area around saint anne's church mm -hmm. it stands to this day yeah one small example uh, of something that he did routinely i mean he built a whole new bridge footing for this theoretical new bridge that i don't believe yeah, I, I still don't think he has permission to build it. He, you know, it may not ever be built. And as I mentioned, you know, Canada th to this day continues to fight against approving a new bridge for him. Yeah. You know, I think there's a few more voices I know want to add something to the story down the line. So I think Sven, this will probably be one we circle back to in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And this uh, news just breaking as we record the show. So I think there's going to be a lot more to come. Energy behind the ongoing protests in the city of Detroit renewed on Friday after a fatal shooting involving an officer near San Juan and McNichols on Detroit's west side. The protests built up quickly as rumors spread across social media of Hakeem Littleton's death and the rumored cause that a teenager was shot in the back of the head execution style. 
Protesters marched from the Bagley neighborhood through the University District to the police precinct on Seven Mile near Woodward. That spurred Detroit police to release body cam footage from the officer within hours. It showed that the incident, in fact, did not happen as was rumored on social media. The video showed that the suspect reached for a gun in his pocket and shot first at a police officer at close range. Other officers on the scene then fatally shot the 20-year-old Littleton. The whole thing escalated in less than five seconds. At the time, Littleton's associate, who police say is a suspected gang member, was being arrested on an outstanding warrant for distributing drugs. Protests were then subdued by weather and the realization that they came together over misinformation, widely shared on social media, that police shot an unarmed teenager. Protests resumed Saturday with an attendance of about 100. Detroit Police Chief James Craig called the officer involved a hero. While critics say that police don't have the strength and don't know how to engage with citizens in a way that's focused on de-escalating conflict. Look, Sven, uh, this one is complicated. And to see how this developed in mere hours from about noon when the shooting happened to the protest to the body cam released footage being released that evening around 730, it was kind of intense. And I'll say that there are definitely systemic issues with police departments, including the Detroit police. Sure. But we need to remember that the city is not a monolith of situations or opinions like these things are all complicated mm-hmm. and they definitely require some introspection and looking at what actually happened on the ground. And I can find folks who think Littleton made a grave mistake and I can find people who think this somehow shouldn't have gone down this way. But uh, having covered some pretty hairy situations in the past, you know, working around news, you know, in the years past, this one in particular is hard to see another path that could have happened. I mean, once a gun gets drawn and pointed at an officer, I think all bets are, are kind of off. To me, the big takeaway is that the power of DPD releasing body cam footage in less than 24 hours, where some departments across the country have taken more than a year. I mean, quick release of this footage every time would help bring a lot more clarity to these difficult conversations, at least I think more often. I mean, obviously, video isn't always going to solve it, but it brings a lot more clarity to what happened as opposed to rumors and hearsay. It was just a good thing that they did that, and I think that needs to be a policy going forward. It's also a good cautionary tale about the ability of misinformation to spread rapidly across social media. I mean, thank God that nothing further happened beyond this fatal shooting, which is bad enough. But I mean, thank God something didn't cause destruction or or further violence from their ire, you know, building up and everything, because, uh, you know, it's easy to see how something like that could have happened. In a sign of what's sure to be an ongoing story, protesters stopped Detroit public school buses hired under contract from leaving their yard Monday morning. The action was in response to plans put into place by Detroit Public Schools Superintendent Dr. Nikolai Vitti that start in-person summer school for about 500 students this week. Behind the protests is a longtime advocacy group called By Any Means Necessary, or BAM. The Detroit News reports that BAM intends to request a preliminary injunction sometime today to stop the Detroit Public Schools Community District from opening 23 school buildings for the first week of in-person summer school. There are additional media reports that bus drivers for a private company were not tested for COVID-19 before going on the streets and not given training masks or sanitizer to deal with the students. The impact of the coronavirus between safety concerns, threats of funding cuts, and concerns around distance learning being very ineffective put school administrators not just in Detroit but across the country in an extremely difficult position. There will be no decision they make that won't get some people very angry. After all, without schools, we can't have a real economic reopening. But it's unclear what the impact of reopening schools will be from a health perspective. Although the fatality rates with children so far is very low... It is not zero. And being indoors in groups for hours at a time with teachers that are often in susceptible categories for more intense cases of COVID-19, well, that puts staff at risk. Superintendent Vitti on Monday tweeted both an image of socially distanced students with masks on and another that said, quote, COVID is not going away. Many of our children need face-to-face direct engagement. We should not make that requirement for all children and families. Parents should be able to choose face-to-face or online. Oh, I mean, Jer, this is going to be the story going forward here in the next you know, couple of months 
as the school year approaches. Los Angeles and San Diego have apparently already made the decisions to go online only. Those are obviously huge districts, which are going to set the tone for many others. I mean, I will say that Los Angeles is right now dealing with a major uh, uptick in coronavirus cases for what it's worth, but uh, you know, cases have been on the uh, upswing, mild upswing here in Michigan, of course, as well, as well as many other states in the country. The Clinton River Watershed Council has launched a scavenger hunt activity for kids and adults meant to encourage exploration and discovery of the 760 square mile watershed. Participants will be known as river rangers. They'll choose their own adventure by completing 10 activities across the watershed, which stretches from Oakland to Macomb County. They'll get a guidebook with 32 activities to choose from. Examples include identifying native plants or animals or participating in a cleanup event. The goal of the Clinton River Quest is to get people outside and learn how they can play a role in protecting water quality. The first 50 people who complete the scavenger hunt will get a steel water bottle or a gift certificate to purchase native plants. It costs $15 to participate. The program runs through the end of September, and we'll put a link to where you can register in the show notes. Joining me on the line is Detroit City Council member Raquel Castaneda-Lopez and Sadie Saar, the founder and executive director of the African Bureau for Immigration and Social Affairs, or ABISA. We're going to talk about a program that's been seeded with $750,000 to help undocumented immigrants impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Councilmember Castaneda Lopez, let's start with you. Why do we need to do this? Why is it important to step up in this way? Uh, one, we know that undocumented uh, people oftentimes work in essential roles and are the most vulnerable in our communities. And unfortunately, they were left out of the federal CARES funding. They didn't get a $1,200 check. They didn't get any type of financial support. And so we know as a community that it's important to make sure everyone is taken care of. And if we're not taking care of each other and everybody, then all of us are less at risk and less um, vulnerable. And so we wanted to make sure that we were standing up for justice and equity and making sure that every single person in the city of Detroit regardless of their immigration status, will get financial support because the virus doesn't discriminate based on nationality, right? Uh, it doesn't matter your race, ethnicity, gender, anyone can get the coronavirus. And so that means everyone should be receiving support financially so that they can feed their kids, so that they can pay their bills and take care of themselves during this pandemic. So it really is the right thing to be doing. How big of a scope do we have here with this? How many people are we talking about that would be covered by this program? So $750,000 may sound like a lot, but we know it's definitely not enough to meet the need. So we estimate that there's roughly a, around maybe seven to 8,000 undocumented immigrants in the city. But if you add to that mixed status families, for, or which are, for example, if you have a it may be a mom that is a U.S. citizen, but the husband is in a green card holder, undocumented. They didn't necessarily qualify for federal funding either. So that then takes the number up to closer to 20000 So 750000 is definitely not going to reach all those folks. But we consider this kind of seed money and hope to grow the fund. But we are hoping to be able to at least support a couple thousand folks in the city of Detroit. So one of the concerns I think about right off the bat is that a lot of folks understandably so, might be distrustful of programs that involve any sort of government at, you know, at, at any level. How, how do you make sure that the aid gets to folks and there isn't that fear that, uh, well, if I take this aid, that I'm going to get tracked down, that kind of stuff? So definitely, we already know that our community members are very afraid and not trustful of the system. However, because five of the organizations and agencies who are helping disperse this money are already rooted in the community, have already proven themselves to their community members. We hope that uh, the first initial fear, it will be not stopping folks from calling us. And when they call us to get the fund, we do explain to them in the process that we are not keeping the information. So organizations are asking to verify residency and so on and so forth on a um, trust level basis, which if, for example, if you call me, I'm like, hey, can you send, show me a picture of a bill? 
that shows your name and I can confirm that you live in Detroit, right? If they do that and send it to me after with a picture, I'm just destroying it. And the database that we are using to compile the application is also going to be destroyed at the end of the program. And the other level of it is that the database actually is being uh, run by a private entity and not by the city. That is another level of protection that we have. And the information that we are asking is very, very minimal. So we already have the, the attach and the network in the community, and we are going to continue to communicate with them in the language that they understand and to prove to them that they don't have to worry. It's just a little token of help that we have and that we work hard for them to have access to, and we ensure that the program is the safest possible for them to be able to get this help because we already understand the sentiment in the community, and we also understand why they have that sentiment. Yeah, yeah. In a perfect world, how much would this program grow? What would you like to see raised in the future to support this community? I think a lot, a lot more. So why do I say that? When the pandemic hit here in Detroit, we have already seen communities helping each other. So Southwest Care had a GoFundMe, and they raised 50 plus thousand. At Abiso, we also had a GoFundMe that raised 50 plus thousand. So during the pandemic, we have already given easily between 300 and 500 K by those small funding just to help support. And we also see that our communities are in greater need than when we were able to support. So this, this money from OSF is another bucket, you know, another layer to help sustain the need that we have seen. But it would be very wonderful if other foundations in the communities are able to help us grow this money, a million or more, because the need is definitely out there. That's a wish, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that we can at least alleviate some of that. But definitely, there is a great, great need in the community. And we are just talking about the undocumented one. But we know that beyond the undocumented one, there is also a bigger need waiting. Yeah, and if I could just jump in, we're hoping to use this as seed money. And I would love to see, you know, some of the um, major foundations in the city of Detroit step up and uh, donate, honestly, a million dollars each. So if we were able to get a million from Ted's Dresby, a million from Kellogg, a million from Ford Foundation, things like that, that would takes the work a lot farther, and we, again, would be able to support a lot more people throughout the city of Detroit. But if you think about the amount of money that people got throughout the country, the one-time $1,200 check, we know that is still insufficient for folks, that people need really regular support to to get through the pandemic, and that's the same type of support that families are going to need that are undocumented. Well, one of the things my listeners always ask about are ways that they can get involved and, you know, put their shoulder to the wheel. If people wanted to get involved or help or, you know, somehow support what you're doing, what could they do? Yeah, so Sadie kind of mentioned this fund is being managed by uh, a nonprofit, trusted nonprofit. The fiscal sponsor is Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation. And then the additional agencies are Avisa, as mentioned, One Michigan Islamic Center of Detroit and Global Detroit. So those are all nonprofits. And I think donating for sure to the fund, and I can give out my number so we can connect people to make that happen. But also in addition to financial resources, there's always need for, you know, other types of donations, whether that's a you know, food assistance or assistance with like diapers and things like that, or sometimes even furniture. So I can give out my number. It's 313-224-2450. If people are looking to donate financially or in terms of items, they can give us a call and we'll connect you with the respective agencies to be able to do that. Well, and I will be sure to put that in the show notes. Both of you, Council Member Castaneda Lopez and uh, Sadie Asar, I appreciate your time so much today on Daily Detroit. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And that'll do it for today's show, friends. If you haven't already, tell your friends about Daily Detroit if you think they would enjoy us. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe wherever you find your favorite shows. And until we chat next time, thanks a lot. I'm Sven Gustafson. And I'm Jarrah Stays. Take care of each other, and we'll get through this together. <laughs>